Hello everyone. Welcome back to the University of the Witwatersrand Fossil Hominid Vault in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm Lee Berger, a paleoanthropologist here at the University of the Witwatersrand and an explorer at large for the National Geographic Society. Today, we're going to explore the way species have been developed in paleoanthropology because fields dealing with fossils have problems that differ from zoologists studying living organisms. First, how does one identify a species? There are typically five usual ways we explore species recognition. The first is mate recognition, where an individual recognizes another as a potential viable mate, which is of course difficult to test in the vertebrate fossil record. Then there's a phonetic definition, whereby we use statistics to compare one set of the remains of organisms with another, looking at similarities and differences. There's also an ecological definition where we use how an organism is adapted to a specific niche. There's also a cladistic definition where a species is a lineage of populations between two phylogenetic branch points. And finally, there's a biological definition where we recognize a species when it can actually or potentially breed in nature producing viable offspring. At one point or another, most of these have been applied to paleoanthropological fossil record. So as we look at species in a paleoanthropological sense, let's begin with some other terms that are important when examining species from a fossil record. First is the concept of a holotype or type specimen as it's often shortened to. In paleoanthropology, a holotype specimen is typically defined either by the first or only specimen to be discovered of a new species or, in better cases, where there have been a number of fossils discovered, the best or most representative specimen of the new species is chosen as the holotype. So a holotype, in a way, sets up, based on its morphology, the anatomy by which a species will be tested against other fossils. Then there may be paratypes. These are, by tradition and convention, assigned at the time of the formal description and naming of a new species. These are typically all other specimens that, either by their own morphology or often their context, are assigned to the holotype species. These paratypes are typically used to either confirm or expand on the variation of the new species. And so their assignment as paratypes, by definition, demonstrates that the describing scientists have high confidence in their association with the new species. But I also want you to keep in mind the problems that might arise if specimens that are not actually in reality part of the new species are in fact different species, and they're assigned to paratypes, and the issues that arise as a species validity is then tested over time. Nevertheless, let's assume the criteria for a new species has been met and it's been put through the peer review process and sits now within our literature. How do we test this? How do we know a species is real? This is the ultimate problem. Most species definitions stress reproductive continuity. That is, members of a species can and do breed and produce viable, fertile offspring. Well, the one thing I can assure you is that these fossils are not going to be reproducing baby fossils anytime soon. So how to solve this seeming conundrum? Well, all we typically have is morphology. But evolution doesn't come with a playbook on how much innovation, or better yet variation, is allowable to maintain a species, a viable reproducing population. We cannot just pull out binoculars, although I wish we could, and observe the past and examine the living hominids and their behaviors. So let's look at how paleoanthropology has broadly handled this problem by looking at a few case studies. We'll look at the species that resulted from these holotype and paratype descriptions individually in greater detail in later lectures. So sometimes it's easy. For example, in the case of the Tong child here, it was the first of its kind found in Africa. No one had found a fossil hominid in Africa before, so it was a first, it was a novelty. And, and when we find fossils like this, 
And we do, even today, be it in a truly novel geographical region, a place in time, out of place, or a morphology simply that compares to nothing else. Well, the job is typically equally easy, but these situations are rare by their nature. Even then, though, Dart faced criticism of his diagnosis, even with this being a first of its kind. Dart had to defend against suggestions from members of the establishment that the Tong baby might even just be an infant gorilla. But it was so novel and, and didn't compare well with the specimens that existed, the species name held. Where the Tong child as a holotype of Australopithecus africanus plays a pivotal role in modern paleoanthropology is whether other fossils found at other sites are the same species as this or a different species. This is a case where a well-known species used commonly today, Australopithecus africanus, has actually been created through the slow addition of specimens, the vast majority of which, in fact, almost every one, are not comparable in any quality way to the holotype specimen of that species. Africanus is a case where most specimens are associated with the species based on either a perception of the biological diversity potential of this infant skull that would likely be allowable over time, or a perception with how many species of bipedal ape are allowable in any given temporal range, even though, ironically, the temporal range of the Tong child isn't known. So the attribution of other fossils to such a species could cause problems, and thus holotypes like the Tong child play an important role in the discussions of phylogeny and relationships in the hominid record. Holotypes such as the Tong child ultimately are as if we built the definition of a species on an unsound ground, much the way a house built on a poor foundation is in danger of falling down. Other problems have also occurred because of naming species on inadequate specimens, even if they are adult. Here's MLD1, the holotype of Australopithecus prometheus. While an adult, this specimen, 80 years in hindsight, should never have been made a holotype. But because Dart chose to make an occipital, the back of the skull, the holotype of this new species, we are stuck with it. So why is this specimen a bad holotype? Well, this area of anatomy we know is highly variable. And so any specimens that have been added to it are really just done on the belief that they represent Prometheus. And when someone compares their specimen to these specimens, well, you can see how the problem becomes compounding as the errors may simply accumulate. And we develop a false sense of variation in a species that might not actually even exist. I personally think the species name associated with such specimens as this one should simply be set aside and not used. And new species names, based on quality holotypes and paratypes, should be established. Another issue that has arisen in paleoanthropology has been the strong influence of preconceptions at any given time in the science's history. This has often led to inappropriate selection of holotypes and paratypes in the past. An example of this is the choices made by the team first describing Australopithecus afarensis, supposedly Lucy species, back in the late 1970s. At the time, the scientists chose to assign as a holotype a specimen neither from the geographical region where most of their discoveries were made. In fact, it came from over 2,000 kilometers away nor was it the best material they had, because they had both partial skeletons such as Lucy and large samples of hominids that came from what appeared to be a single depositional event. That's the first family, the 333 assemblage. Yet, even with this other material, they chose to use a mandible from Lytoli, Tanzania as the holotype and assigned all the other specimens from Ethiopia and from Tanzania as paratypes. This was even though they recognized a great deal of variation in the sample, having previously suggested it contained both Homo and Australopithecus. They chose a mandible as the holotype as they felt that teeth would ultimately be key in differentiating species as the ultimate 
morphological silver bullet. But that idea, the idea that teeth can absolutely discriminate species, has not stood the test of time. The effect of this decision has been that Afarensis has become a very well-known species, but may in fact be a chimera species, particularly where postcranial remains and isolated teeth are concerned as we now know that no less than two other species existed in the same time and the same place. And we can have little way of telling what remains belong to which species. We'll look more at this problem when we delve into Afarensis in future lectures. Let's now look at another example of species naming problems around holotypes and paratypes. When we first discovered the site of Malapa in 2008, we had, as the best examples, two partial skeletons, including one, a teenaged individual, MH1, with a nearly complete skull, and another, an adult female with excellent postcranial remains and a mandible, but no skull. We thus had a decision to make. Did we make the more complete specimen, the holotype, and accept the problems of assigning a juvenile as such, or use the less complete adult? We were lucky enough, of course, to have enough of both skeletons that we could compare the two and see that there was no real variation between them other than that which would be likely attributed to one being a male and the other a female. And so in the end we chose to make MH1 the holotype, in addition recognizing that it was approaching adulthood and didn't require much more growth. And thus the major forms of its anatomy wouldn't change over that short period of time. The wisdom of making MH1 the holotype will be tested by us and others over time. But an interesting criticism at the time we published this decision, and one that is the focus of a lecture that's coming soon, was that based on the date alone, and not the morphology, it was assumed that Sediba must be a chronospecies of Australopithecus africanus. That is, the scientists who suggested this idea didn't care about the morphology of Sediba that we had published, but the time and place it had been found here in southern Africa, thus basing their assessment on a strong preconception of when and where certain important events in hominid evolution must have taken place. Let's finally take a look at Homo naledi. Here is the holotype DH1. In this case, we were extremely lucky to not only have a very large sample, over 15 individuals, and practically every bone in the body represented multiple times over these individuals, but the context itself was extraordinary, with the hominids coming from a highly constrained place within the cave. Furthermore, the morphology of Naledi, whether postcranial or craniodental, was almost identical across the whole assemblage. This made decisions about what to assign is the holotype less of an issue, and so we chose a hominid that had much of the skull and teeth preserved and had a strong case to be associated with a complete hand, one with diagnostic features on it. The remainder of the assemblage was listed as paratypes, thus defining the species. At the time we announced this new species, we used the whole assemblage to describe it, and yet, the first response, which admittedly was by the same scientists who had criticized Sediba, was that this was clearly only a primitive Homo erectus, based only on, you guessed it, the teeth, without looking or comparing the rest of the anatomy, even though we had so much of it. So I'm going to end this lecture here, but let's just say that holotypes, paratypes, and the fossils chosen to represent them are very important in paleoanthropology. And as we go through these original collections and other samples, you'll see the effects of these choices on the way the field viewed human evolution and the relationship of different hominid species to the central pattern of human evolution. But more on that later. For now, I'm Lee Berger, and goodbye from the University of the Witwatersrand Fossil Hominid Vault here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Everyone be safe out there and keep washing your hands.